And I'm Matt Powell, choice of Al Shankland, Stylish Shankland. Um, welcome everyone to the second Shankland Lecture of the 2016. I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Carol Tully, who's the force behind one of the more interesting research projects this <laughs> university has done. I love this. The European Travelers to Wales, title European the Company. If you haven't been to the website, absolutely go. You'll find out where from 1750 onwards, who's been here, why they came, what they saw, and what they thought about it. Uh, and I believe Carol is going to give us some talking in that area. I am indeed, yes. So I will okay. leave you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm going to start with two apologies. Uh, first of all, my voice is still suffering from Freshers' Week, and uh, it might disappear halfway through this, but I'll try and keep going. That's why we moved a bit closer. Uh, secondly, some of you will have heard bits of this before, because as, as is the nature with an ongoing research project, uh, you have different iterations of things uh, as you move forward. So some of the material might be familiar, some of it won't be. Um, I'd like to start, though, just by explaining a little bit about the project itself. It's funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, who were very generous in awarding us uh, over £400,000 to do this project. And it's um, a collaboration between uh, Bangor, myself, um, the Ganolfan in Aberystwyth, um, Swansea University, and also the National Library of Wales and the Ceredigion Museum. And we've also worked going through the project with Storiel, of course, and the Swansea Museum. So it's been a very collaborative project. Um, to explain a little bit about why it started, why we had the idea to look at European travellers to Wales in the first place, I'm afraid it all starts with a Scotsman. <laughs> Shock surprise. Uh, and indeed, uh, one of the most famous Scotsmen in the literary context, of course, Sir Walter Scott. Uh, the part of Scotland that I come from I come from a town called Galashiels, which is very, very close to where uh, Scott was born uh, and where he lived in Abbotsford. And um, when you live in Galashiels, it's a little bit like living in a Walter Scott theme park. Everywhere you go, everything has some association with Walter Scott, whether it's the name of the school, the name of the pub, the name of the streets, everything. And when you try and break out of Galashiels and make your way to the metropolis of Edinburgh, you get off at Waverley Station and you come out of Waverley Station and there he is again in this massive monument on Princess Street. So I do literally come from Scott, double T, land, okay? When I actually started studying Romanticism, which is my main area of research, um, as a postgraduate, I soon realised that he wasn't just very present in my world, but he was very present all over Europe, absolute crucial figure. Uh, so influential for the development of the novel, but also, of course, for the image of Scotland as a place, because you know, he effectively created the image that we, we know today as the kind of kitsch tourist version of Scotland. Um, and when I then came to live in Wales many years ago, 1998, I arrived in Bangor, thinking I'd only be here for a couple of years. That didn't work. Um, I sort of thought, well, that's interesting, because you know, a lot of the Scottish elements of culture the Celtic, etc., is very present in European Romanticism, but Wales isn't. It's not there. Can't, can't, you know, couldn't find any particular references to the Welsh context in the European Romantic uh, view. And that really got me thinking about how, on, how one could uh, try and explore that, try and find out a bit more. And of course, I came across in doing that some wonderful work by um, Damon and Walford Davis and Linda Pratt, who've done a lot on Wales and the Romantic imagination. Uh, and that really got, got us thinking, uh, uh, myself and my, my colleagues, on how we might expand this a little bit by looking at something around travel writing. What did the Europeans who came to Wales actually think of it? And that's what I'm going to be talking about this evening. Um, just in terms of the project, uh, if you understand the genesis of it, but the project itself is producing quite a few outputs. We've c we're kind of towards the end now. Um, it's a co-authored book and articles, two PhDs, one of whom is based in Bangor. We've held our conference that was held in the National Library last year. We have the database, which is on the website that, that Eben referred to, and uh, I would recommend you have a look at it. It's actually come out really well. We're really pleased with it. Uh, we thought we were only going to find about 100 accounts of Wales. We found over 450, and they're still appearing uh, in all sorts of sources. We had an exhibition, which some of you might have seen, uh, came to Storiel. Uh, had the benefit of being a travelling exhibition about travellers, which is uh, an unusual thing, I suppose. Uh, and we've also produced quite a lot of educational materials to go alongside uh, the exhibition. 
The only bit we haven't done is the book. No cost extension, thank you, EHRC. So it will get done, but uh, that's the way of these things. Um, just to give you uh, some background, really, or some, some highlights that we found uh, as we've um, gone through. The inspirations for most of the travellers coming to Wales, and I'll talk a little bit about this when, when I'm talking about the individual texts, um, they see Wales very much through the Scottish prism because that is their Celtic mindset. So it's Macpherson's Ossian, uh, it's Scott's Rob Roy that they kind of uh, envision Wales through, which uh, is, is quite an interesting mix in a way. And as I say, I'll talk a bit more about that when I talk about some of the texts. There are some unexpected Welsh highlights. So what are they interested in when they come to Wales? Not perhaps what you might expect necessarily. Big interest in Methodism, which doesn't go down awfully well, particularly with the Germans. They're not, they're not keen on Methodism as a, as, a, uh, as a denomination, but they're very interested in it. They're very interested to see how it's spread across the country. They're also very interested in uh, social life, generally. The ladies of Flangothlin are a big hit. Uh, everybody who can possibly visit them does, whether they're invited or not. And uh, it's um, something that uh, causes a bit of a, a frisson, I suppose, as well. But, you know, a lot of them were going to Wales to um, live with or, or to, to reside with the gentry in Wales anyway. So that was kind of the, uh, the, the cycle um, that they went through. And then finally, the other thing that is a, a real focus of interest um, is industrialisation. And particularly the work of Thomas Telford and other Scott, sorry, they're everywhere. Um, and as Telford's work develops through, through the early century, um, he, it basically becomes a tour in its own right because people are coming to see the things that he creates. Uh, the Pumkazisla Aqueduct, of course, the Menai Bridge. And they're, they're absolutely amazed by them. They're completely gobsmacked, blown away by the whole thing. Oh, hang on. That's a bit harder. Uh, when the earliest travellers in our series of, of texts come, uh, they're building their trips on the information that they're able to glean from English sources because there are no European sources at this point. And the two main figures who have an impact there are, of course, Thomas Pennant, you'd expect that, uh, and also William Hutton, um, maybe a little bit more of a surprise, but they are kind of the key texts that they, they follow. It's not that Pennant was necessarily translated into the languages, but in the educated upper and middle classes of Europe, his work was circulated, uh, albeit in the original. So they they had something to follow, and they're quite often taking exception to things that he said and critiquing what, what he comes up with. What then happens after that, of course, is a layering of texts as, as the, the English texts disappear off the bottom of the reading list, if you like, as more and more German and, and, and French texts appear. And what I've got here, I'm not sure if it's going to be visible to you from the back uh, on the screen, but this is just some information taken straight from the database on the website, just to give you a, a feel for what information we found out. Uh, and this particular one shows you how the records are distributed, the travel accounts are distributed over time. So we start down here, uh, the very, very, very earliest we found was 1666, but it's a real outlier. So say, 1770s through to uh, 2011 onwards, so the, the present day basically. And you can see the spread of travel, and there's this massive spike uh, in the mid-19th century, and that's the influence, the interest in industrialisation, the interest in uh, Telford, and also the interest in, or the growing interest in Celtic philology, particularly in the German context, that people start coming uh, for those reasons. Uh, you've also got the gender split there, the orange are the males, the reds are the females, the greys are the unknowns, uh, i.e. anonymous writers. Um, so you can, you know, you get a, a quite interesting uh, indication of just of, of how travel has gradually become a little bit less gender specific over time. But uh, that's just a, a side comment, really. Uh, we c we've also got a graph that shows you why people came. So there's different reasons. Uh, the, the darker red here is anything around tourism of some sort. The blue is around uh, study of some sort. Uh, the, the lighter orange is around kind of if you're visiting family uh, or, or uh, coming for reasons of, of immigration. Uh, and then uh, the, the sort of conference going becomes quite a feature later on, actually, because all these academics are floating around Wales writing their, their stories. Anyway, uh, and again, you can see what in that middle period, uh, the 19th century, which I'm going to talk a little bit about in a, in a minute uh, in relation to some of the text, you've got the um, 
large amount of interest again in industrialisation. It really is, is the key thing. Uh, and why they come to Wales, why they're so interested in Wales, uh, we'll see in a bit. Uh, it just gives you a general image there of where people came from. The majority are from Western Europe, Belgium, France, Netherlands, Austria, Germany and Switzerland. France and Germany are the two main sources. It's the Germans first, then the French, and then the Dutch come in. And then after that, it's a kind of smattering of anybody from anywhere, really. Uh, uh, very, very few from the south of Europe. No Spaniards at all. At least, if they came, they, didn't, they couldn't be bothered to write about it, Helen. I don't know. But anyway, they, 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 were, uh, they, they were not particularly uh, uh, keen on, on recording their, their trips. Uh, I'll just get another overview of, um, in, in pie chart form, of the reasons for travel. And now we get to the interesting bit. Where did they go when they came? What was of interest? Well, level pegging at the top, we've got Carnarvon Castle and the Menai Suspension Bridge. The bridge was in the lead, but Carnarvon Castle caught up uh, a few weeks ago when we found some more accounts. So uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's still neck and neck, but you never know it could change. Uh, and then you've got you know, a kind of a range of things. And so some places are further down than you would expect. Um, St Davis Cathedral, for example, uh, plus now it's relatively far down the list, given that a lot of people uh, do reference um, the ladies of Slangothlin. But the two, key, the two crucial ones really are, are the Caravan Castle Menai Suspension Bridge. North Wales uh, is the, the, the key destination most of the time. And this next slide really, if I can get to go, there we go, is uh, very important because it proves something that we knew already, which is that Bangor is the most important place in Wales and the most visited. So there we go. Uh, by a country mile, uh, way ahead of Carnarvon, way ahead of Cardiff, uh, uh, even ahead of Holyhead, because Holyhead is kind of the reason a lot of people were coming through Bangor, because they were heading for Ireland. But uh, Bangor gets a lot more mentions than anywhere else, mainly because of the hotels in the earlier period. Uh, but also there's interest in Penryn Quarry, in the Penryn Castle, etc. So people do stop and, and explore for Bangor. So anyway, I like to mention that when I'm in Aberystwyth. Okay, I'm going to talk, uh, turn now to, my, to my, my lecture proper. That was just a bit of an overview of, of, of what we've done and some of the information that we've found. Um, and I'm going to talk now about really some of the travellers who, who came to Wales, what they saw, what they thought uh, and um, what they wrote. Okay, so writing in his Correspondence of a Dead Man, Hermann von Pukla Moskau, who travelled around North Wales in 1829, noted that Wales was an unknown entity, hidden between England and Ireland, as he put it. His ob observation is both accurate and misleading. For the travelling German in the 19th century, Wales was either a complete non-entity, merely an adjunct, often unexpected, to England, where a strange language was spoken, or the specific destination for enthusiastic Celticists and industrial explorers drawn by the ancient bardic culture or the developing technology of the mining heartlands of North and South Wales. Drawing on the travel writing of this period, this paper will explore that dichotomy and show how Wales, framed as a peripheral other, is used by travellers as a means both to reflect on their own cultures and as a site of cultural discovery. Central to this is the ongoing engagement with and reaction to the prevailing German Anglomania of the period which is placed under scrutiny as a result of the encounter with Wales. The Celtic world with which we would automatically associate Wales today was big news in the late 18th and 19th centuries. In the European context, the view of that world centred primarily on the Herderian enthusiasm for Ossian and was fed by the popular and increasingly voluminous works of Sir Walter Scott. The Celtic nations became something of an exotic northern ideal infused with druidic mysticism and an active Volksgeist, which functioned both as an opposite and an accessory to the, in the ongoing romantic quest for cultural self-definition. One anomaly to emerge, however, is the scant attention paid to the reception of a specifically Welsh aspect in the Celtic cultural landscape. In essence, this was the result of a tendency to simply subsume Wales into an amorphous notion of the Celtic, within which both Scotland and Ireland nevertheless maintained a delineated identity. There was an awareness of the existence of Wales, but no, really, no real understanding of what, or indeed where, it was. 
The situation also reflected the contemporary status of Wales in the wider European context. Scotland, until recently a nation in her own right and with a long tradition of scholarship, and Ireland, still the scene of active rebellion and at the heart of the European Christian tradition, stood out as cultural entities. While Wales, lacking a major metropolis and without a base for scholarship, remained at best an adjunct to England with an uncertain and undefined status. As the accessibility of Wales improved with innovations such as Telford's Coach Road and the spread of industrialisation westwards, the visibility of Wales began to improve. And this results in an interesting dynamic. The gradual emergence of an understanding, indeed a reading of Wales, is framed against the backdrop of the widespread cultural anglomania which ca characterised much European travel writing on the British Isles in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. This established a set of expectations in travellers that they were travelling in a rapidly industrialising, forward-thinking country. Consequently, what they find when they go to Wales, still underdeveloped in many areas and in many ways culturally alien, shocks them, precisely because they were expecting to find England. This response also has an impact on their understanding of England itself. The pre-travel expectations created by Anglomania effectively masks the reality of the Welsh situation from the outside, to the extent that when writers find themselves there, they are forced to rethink their views on English government and ideals. They are faced with a quasi-colonial scenario which cuts across their understanding of British democracy and development. This in turn impacts on their self-understanding as travellers from a fragmented set of German-speaking lands. Seeking a positive paradigm in England, against which to measure their own slow democratic and industrial advance, they find themselves confronted with an equally fragmented British Isles with many issues still to resolve. So the utopia they expect to find isn't uniformly available. By exploring the work of several writers across the 19th century, I hope to show how the reading of Wales undergoes a number of shifts as travellers grapple with the reality of what they find there. The understanding of what Wales has to offer the German reading public shifts cyclically from romantic ideal to industrial aspiration. The image which prevails towards the end of the century is one we might recognise, one of a nation of bards and princes. One of the first German travel texts to deal with Wales in any great reflective detail and which tackles the issues thrown up by the unexpected nature of Wales was Christian August Gottlieb Goethe's uh, England, Wales, Ireland and Scotland, uh, Recollections of Nature and Art from a Journey in the Years 1802 to 1803, slappy title, which was published in five volumes in Dresden from 1804 to 1805. Uh, here's the man himself on the screen. Goethe, a lawyer and professor of law at both Jena and Göttingen, addresses the issue quite early in his narrative of Wales, noting of the traveller in England that, upon arriving in Wales, quote, should he imagine he is simply travelling to another province of the same country, then he will be amazed to find himself among a foreign people, which differs from the English in a quite particular way in terms of language, appearance, customs and lifestyle. Uh, you'll note also, you know, his trip is predominantly in North Wales. Most of the the ones I'm looking at this evening are basically focusing on North Wales because that was where the German focus really was. Um, That's a, a lot of activity around this part of the country. Gouda openly attacks the expectations established by Anglomania and prepares the reader for the unexpected. He engages with existing travel accounts, but these are primarily English medium sources such as Thomas Pennant and William Hutton. Building on these initial layers, his work is key in setting the expectations for a German-speaking audience, unfamiliar other than in very vague terms with, with the concept or reality of Wales. The path he travels through North Wales is a well-worn one, as he finds himself in the mail coach in the company of fellow travellers on their way to Ireland. His English travelling companions, informed by their own expectations of the peripheral other, are somewhat taken aback at his plans to disembark in North Wales, uh, describing his intentions as extremely adventurous and warning him against the bare mountains, ugly women and poor wine. <laughs> Gouda, in contrast, finds the whole experience quite romantic and repeats the adjective undoubtedly in its Schlegelian sense throughout his description. The view of Wales presented to his German-speaking readership is clearly intended to establish a romantic vision of the nation and its culture which, set, which sets it firmly apart from its English neighbour. 
Indeed, <coughs> excuse me, Goethe's appraisal of the Welsh in general is marked by an uncomfortable set of comparisons between England and Wales, which betray a sense of unease at the relationship between the two nations. On occasion, he seems frustrated by what he finds, on others, simply disappointed. In Goethe's text, in clear counter to the prevailing Anglomania, the sense is one of, he of English hegemonic deficiency rather than Welsh cultural reticence. And this becomes increasingly clear as the travelogue progresses. A reference to the dislike of the English and other less positive comments on Welsh society are placed in context by a scathing attack on the English government for its neglect of Wales in terms of education, industry and religion, which is turn in turn placed in the context of the treatment of Ireland and the colonies. For the first time, even in this most romantic and sympathetic of travelogues, there is the sense that Wales needs to be advanced and that the English are at fault for not having achieved this. This is epitomised by the use of English as a working language for the legal system. In Goethe's narrative, the positive role of Welsh in the, the Welsh language in the creation of the sense of community is starkly juxtaposed with the part language plays in alienating many from a legal system worded in a tongue they barely understand. The first shift away from this culturally hypersensitive perspective comes in Samuel Heinrich Speaker's Journey Through England, Wales and Scotland in the year 1816 on the screen. The focus here, over a decade, over a decade later, and by now reflecting a post-Napoleonic worldview, is, despite an acknowledgement of the thoroughly romantic landscape, firmly centred on current social customs and the advance of industry. There is no sentimental engagement with Welsh culture, other than the brief mention of certain key historical figures, and the issues of the language, folk culture or religion are conspicuously absent. Shpika, who was a librarian to the King of Prussia, instead makes mu much of the poor roads and marvels at the work of Thomas Telford, who he claims to know personally, uh, in improving communications. Speaker's factual approach is more in tune with that of Pennant's pre-romantic travel discourse, and while Goethe singles out the English for criticism for their colonial failures, Speaker's concerns are devoid of any explicit political import. Instead, his account is essentially supportive of a hegemonic discourse, describing Wales with an exploitative detachment, which views the landscape and contemporary Welsh culture as an economic opportunity, rather than the source of an autonomous cultural paradigm. Uh, and again, apart from a very brief foray into South Wales, you'll see he's mostly A5-ish or along the coach road there up at this, this end as well. Now we get to the crazy one. Okay. Equally exploitative of Wales and Welsh culture is Hermann von Pukla Moskau. Uh, it's not it's for good reason that he's got an ice cream named after him in Germany, but anyway. Uh, this aristocrat was something of an eccentric who published the record of his tour of the British Isles in 1828 and 1829, long before his death, under the rather morbid title Letters of a Dead Man, which was published in 1830. Here we see another quite different engagement which focuses on the romantic nature of the landscape, but effectively uses Wales as a background for the author's own idiosyncratic posturing and outrageous adventures. The countryside is highly praised, but less attention is paid to its dramatic aesthetic than to the exploits of Pukla Moscow himself in, descend in ascending the heights and dallying with the local female population. Despite some passing references to myths and legends, there's no sense that he's actually aware of any great sense of alterity. The language is mentioned briefly, compared to the coin of crows, and despite the author's clearly staunch religious views, Methodism is simply ignored. Instead, Pukla Muska positions himself dramatically in the landscape like an actor on a stage. This parallels his treatment of the Irish landscape and culture, perhaps a sign that in this case, self-promotion rather than cultural interest were at the core of his endeavours. One aspect which does emerge, however, is the backward nature, as he sees it, of Welsh and Irish society, highlighting once more a perceived need for modernisation and progress. This is highlighted by his visits to several country houses, which he describes as English in essence. This includes Plasnawith uh, in Flagothlin. He visits the ladies without an invitation, which is... He gets in because of his character, but not many other people did. Um, this is juxtaposed, this, the English emphasis uh, in, in the, the country houses is juxtaposed with regular references to the poverty found amongst the Welsh rural classes. Interestingly, despite this, he tends to exoticise what he sees in terms of the architecture and language. 
Despite this appreciation, there's a sense that he forms part of the civilising force being brought to bear on the Welsh via the improvements in industry and infrastructure noted by many other travellers. Bukler Muscow evidences this by his lending of English language novels to the Welsh girl serving at his hostelry in Bangor, uh, the very hostelry which eventually became this university, by the way. There you go. Um, or at least the building of it. Uh, these first three texts um, show the dichotomy of appreciation with an exoticised, romanticised Wales, the focus of some travellers' attention, and the industrial, the centre of other works. So you've got kind of two two Waleses emerging in, in the German imagination. The first text to tackle this dichotomy head-on is our next one, which is Johann Georg Kohl's Journey in England and Wales, 1844. It's worth noting, actually, that the texts that I'm referring to in this, coincidentally, are probably the only ones that actually reference Wales in the title, because that was why we found so many extra, title, extra accounts, because when we started digging under England and everything else, you suddenly find a lot more about Wales. So th these are actually a little bit anomalous in, in the fact that they do mention Wales in the title. Uh, but they're also some of the most uh, detailed of, of uh, the accounts. <coughs> Excuse me. Cole is a critical traveller. Uh, he makes his way to Bangor from Liverpool by boat, viewing the North Wales landscape from the sea in the first instance. Uh, and his text foregrounds the experience of travel. On arrival in Bangor, he admires the Menai Bridge, but sees its majesty being dwarfed by the immensity of the landscape. His descriptions of slate mining, while detailed, maintain the sense of awe found in this, with the feeling that despite attempts to industrialise, the sublimity of Wales and the Welsh landscape will dominate. This is evidenced in his highlighting of the prevalence of ruins in Wales, which sit in stark juxtaposition with the industrial processes he also observes. He's particularly incisive in relation to the Welsh language and the fate of Welsh culture in general. He notes the mispronunciation of Welsh place names by the English. Uh, this is to some extent explained by his later discussion of the difficulties posed by the Welsh language in terms of orthography and pronunciation. Um, doesn't mention anything about the grammar, but if a German starts criticising grammar, they've got no grounds to say anything because it's also very complicated. <laughs> Uh, he notes the anglicisation of South Wales in contrast to the prevalence of the monolingualism in the North and makes an important comparison with Ireland and Scotland, noting that the Welsh language has survived against the odds when compared to the forms of Gaelic elsewhere. Um, although he references South Wales, interestingly, his, his travel again is, is predominantly, well, only in the North, so it's quite interesting. Uh, it does look like he's arrived on a helicopter because he just sort of appears there, but he has <laughs> on the, a couple on the sea. Um, Cole highlights a sense of the exotic in relation to Wales, which, which as what he terms an anhensel, so sort of adjunct, a sort of hanging on uh, element to the side of England, that it should be familiar, but it isn't, uh, because it's a different place, because it's a different culture. That exoticism is, however, he feels under threat. His observations are loaded with political and social comment. The prescient assumption that schooling will eventually be in English that Wales is, its culture notwithstanding, part of England, and that Wales is there for exploitation by England. He seeks to place Wales in a broader context, comp comparing it to the Tyrol, but like many others, reverts eventually to the Celtic comparators backed up by the novels of Walter Scott, Ossian, and a link to the Arthurian legend. There we go. Similarly aware of the dichotomy is Carl Gustav Carros, who published his... Uh, England and Scotland in the year 1844, uh, the following year. The record of a trip undertaken with the King of Prussia, his is one of the few travelogues to encompass the whole of Wales, travelling from the south via Aberystwyth to North Wales. So it's got kind of, doesn't go quite over, but at least it's the whole way up. Um, it's a slightly weird e experience as well because he's with the king. Everywhere he goes, there's people cheering. <laughs> or at least curiously coming out to see this, this foreign <laughs> king. So it's slightly different from some of the other ones. Um, throughout, he refers to Wales as part of England, which is not uncommon. Yet despite this, is very, very, very well informed on Welsh history and culture. His interests are twofold, focusing on the ruins of castles, but also on the spread of industry. Uh, but even then, he gives this a literary emphasis with explicit comparisons of the smelting works in South Wales with Dante's Inferno. This, ex this exoticisation is taken further in his comparison of the physiognomy of the South Walians with some of the females described in Cook's Travels. 
He notes the poverty, yet remains focused on the sublime landscape, theatrical setting of castles such as Carnarvon and the alpine nature of Snowdon. The text almost entirely exoticises Wales, while also acknowledging the advance of modernity with a first reference to the second Menai crossing, which was in planning at this time. I don't know if people's going to make anything of the third one, but maybe not. By the mid-century, however, the emphasis shifts once more to the romantic. So you go from a kind of more rounded view uh, in, the, in the sort of mid-century text, and then it, it starts to shift back to the romantic. Uh, and with that, we have an increasingly negative comparison with England. Uh, this is to some extent driven by the rise in the study of Celtic philology in Germany and the increased access to works of literature such as the Mabinogion, now of course available in English translation. Indicative of this trend is Julius Rodenberg's An Autumn in Wales, Land and People, Fairy Tales and Songs. It is as twee as it sounds. Um, this is a gentleman here, and he was, as you can see, again, predominantly, if not only, in, in North Wales. Uh, and these, are, these were experiences of a, of a trip to North Wales in 1856. Rodenberg sees his work on Wales as having two distinct parts, his memoirs and the cultural content. Throughout the text, issues of uh, Welsh identity centre on the juxtaposition of Wales with neighbouring England. The relationship between the two cultures presented as a tense one. Rodenberg's own views are subjectively polarised, focusing his attention on contemporary England, the negative, while consistently emphasising Wales' past, the positive. His first view of Wales is as a majestic but mysterious other, clearly defined in his narrative as an essentially foreign land, one at the heart of his romantic ideas. The fragility of that reading of Wales, and therefore of what Rodenberg perceives to be Wales' identity as a nation, is made clear in the frequent references to the advance of tourism and the negative impact of mass travel on the sites visited. The negativity brought by, as he puts it, specifically English travellers arriving on their English-funded railway is encapsulated in Rodenberg's caricature of three tourists from Birmingham. This isn't actually them, but it's how I imagine them, so it's a perfect picture. Um, these travelling industrialists are presented as Philistines, unable to appreciate in full the land they have come to see. I quote, The knife manufacturer slept, but every time he woke up, he spoke to me. Beautiful country on the whole, this Wales, he said. Apart from the mountains, I find they spoil the view. <laughs> and greatly hinder the traffic, said the materialist, filling himself another pipe. End of quote. I wasn't going to try that in a Birmingham accent, that would have been a bad idea. Um, the adventures of these three men are woven into the narrative as a constant reminder of what Wales has to endure in terms of its neighbours. Indeed, it's not the new railway reaching into Wales from England, but rather the more traditional mode of transport sailing from Carnarvon docks, which is presented as Wales' mean, means of engagement with the wider world. These views are echoed, but to some extent also critiqued, in my final text today. Um, travelling towards the end of the century along the north coast from Wales, from Chester uh, to the far end of North Wales, Celticist and Hispanist Hugo Schuchat engages directly with the layering of travel accounts I referred to earlier in his Celtic letters of 1875. His intention is clear, to revise expectations and rehabilitate the understanding of Wales for a German readership. His entire approach is based on casting expectation aside. Yet in his narrative, Schuchart focuses on what had then become the standard topics in travel writing on Wales. He discusses Methodism and the resulting puritanical lifestyle of the Welsh. He covers the survival of the Welsh language and the Eisteddfod phenomenon, and he notes how hospitable the Welsh are, although he does seem rather obsessed with their reluctance to provide napkins. He makes a critical appraisal of the widely accepted historical view of the bardic tradition, and is clearly well versed in the use <coughs> in contemporary criticism and scholarship. He notes also the use of Welsh in Sunday schools as opposed to English as a me at the medium for state education. And, like the others, he makes the link to Ossian. This suggests the impact of expectation had, despite his best intentions, guided Schuchart to specific topics and specific places as it had many travellers before him. 
Nevertheless, this is a man on a mission to tackle preconceptions at their source. He begins by outlining the English expectations of Wales as created by the often London-based periodical press. Quote here. No prejudice can be less just and less understandable than that held by the English in relation to everything Welsh. Journalists are particularly hard on the poor taffy. If they could only refrain from making such silly mistakes. The Times, for example, claim that Gaelic is spoken in Wales. Furthermore, the English find it really funny to hear Welsh being spoken. They are convinced it's not possible to communicate in such a strange language. In fact, how could anyone communicate in any other language than English? End of quote. Schuchat's overall criticism extends, however, even to those who have presented Wales in a positive light. Introducing his narrative, he tells his reader that he does not intend to describe the places he visits. Uh, he does actually do this quite a lot. But that he will instead direct the reader to two sources. Black's Picturesque Guide to North Wales, in its fifth edition by 1874, and to Julius Rodenberg's 1858 Autumn in Wales. Surprisingly, the only German source Schuchart claims to be aware of. This would suggest that he is happy to rely on the accounts of others to frame his expectations, but instead he launches almost immediately into an attack on Rodenberg's work, claiming that while it is an agreeable book, it is too poetic with a questionable accuracy and large sections derived from, if not actually plagiarised, from Roberts' 1815 Cambrian Popular Antiquities. He may have a point. I don't think it would have stood a Turnitin test. Um, later in the text, he, turns to, he returns to his criticism of Rodenberg himself, trying to undermine the expectation of Welsh life which his predecessor has presented. In so doing, he's clearly conscious of the layering of texts which has built up expectations of Wales over the previous century. He notes, for example, that the accounts in several works of the pretty girls in the town of Bala are accurate and proven. The problem is, it would seem, that neither the positive German view nor the negative English view of Wales is really authentic. The peripheral land remains unknown, despite the efforts of various writers to make it familiar, their work drawing variously, heavily on myth and stereotype. He points to the existence of a type of Celtomania, one at odds with the Anglomania of the early century, and still prevalent in many travel works of the period. In conclusion then, German travellers to Wales in, 19, in the 19th century fail in many ways to find a stable reading of Wales or Welsh culture. Destabilised by what they find, somewhere which isn't England, and unsure of how to categorise what they find, romantic, sublime, Celtic, versus industrial, exploitable, colonial, they produce a cycle of texts which grapple with all of these. The expectations they have of England are thus undermined, which in turn compromises the validity of their reading via Anglomania of that nation once set on an aspirational pedestal prior to arrival here. Wales may have been hidden from view, but it certainly got them thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? No, I, I mean, so, some of them didn't know each other, like Cole and Carlos knew each other, they were travelling at similar times. Um, what you tend to find is that they're, because often they're, they're travelling for different reasons, they're travelling, uh, whether it's on business or, or for, for scholarly advancement or uh, cultural um, development, whatever, they tend to be travelling on their own. Uh, the texts over time refer to each other going through uh, until you get round about eight, from about 1860 onwards they get a lot more derivative at that point and you find that um, you'll have excerpts or, or, or versions of text being republished slightly repackaged I mean so it kind of fits with the whole publishing boom and the whole kind of, 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 of upsurge in, in tourism per se so there's more of a market for the, for the work and a lot of the earlier texts that we find are written not as travel writing in the uh, purest sense they are things like diaries or letters or 
um, quite very, 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 very detailed sometimes descriptions of industrial sites, which are also travelogues. Um, but the, tra the travel itself has less of a role than the endless page-long descriptions of how to create slates, for example. I mean, the, you know, the, the, they're almost technical guides on, on, on how the industrial processes worked. But the reason that they're so interested in that is that obviously what's going on here is so far ahead of particularly what's going on in Germany because the, the whole industrial process there is, is quite a bit later. So they're coming as spies, basically. They're coming here to get as much info as possible. So just you know, to go back to your original question, they don't, they don't tend to... They'll, self, they'll refer to each other year on year, uh, or refer back to each other, rather. But there's not really a sense of a, a collective. Not in the 19th century, anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hang on. I, I am actually... I, was, I noticed that dot. I was thinking... But I'm not sure. You could check on the website, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm just uh, wondering if we break down the sort of um, uh, nation-state framework for all of these visitors, so Germany, yeah. France, and we sort of look at the sort of stateless <coughs> nations within this 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 this, this country. So perhaps uh, Breton travellers, yeah. or I mean, I'm sure even though you, you said that the sort of Spanish. Uh, uh, context did not yield so many accounts. I'm pretty sure that Wales has featured in, mm -hmm. in terms of the Galician imagination yeah. because of the sort of yeah, sense yeah. of cultural fraternity with the, the myth of, of yeah. the Celtic origins as well. Uh, so just wondering if you sort of break down big European nation yeah, states and yeah. um, when things do. There's a, there, there's a lot of Breton writing, there's a lot, particularly around um, the later 19th century. Um, there's a whole squad of them come across for. Uh, the Eisteddfod, and you know it's quite a big, it's quite a big deal, uh, and there's a, a whole series of accounts recorded. They do actually write as a group, as it happens, around that because um, they're sort of bouncing off each other. Um, in terms of other stateless nations, not that I can think of, interestingly. That would be more attuned. Yeah. Maybe post-colonial, even though of course they wouldn't use those terms. Not really. Not really. I mean, I suppose the, the closest you get is that you know the, the German travellers of the up until 1871 are travelling from their individual German-speaking lands rather than Germany. Um, but it's not it's not such a feature uh, as it is with the Breton writers, definitely. And I don't. I mean, it, uh, maybe the uh, Galicians must have must have no, in latter years, years it's definitely. <coughs> Yeah. Actually, which is actually dedicated to a Welsh woman. Yeah. Uh, but she was never here. No. It's not trying yeah. to count. But it, it does feature in the Yeah, yeah. Okay. Can you just tell us how the European travellers actually arrived in Norfolk? Did they come by sea or did they travel through England? Or? Uh, various routes, I think. Um, it's, it's, it's quite interesting because it starts to dictate what they write about as well. So they start, they start the century coming either on the mail coach. Uh, or on horseback, and in some cases on foot, actually, some quite adventurous people. Uh, but if they're travelling under their own steam like that, they're actually much more flexible, so you find them going different places. And then, as the A5 develops, that becomes what guides people through, because they're, it's the easiest way to move around. Um, then the trains come in, of course, and that slightly shifts again, uh, the, the, the angle uh, of, of entry, to the north at least. Um, there's a lot coming in, I mean, there's a lot that will go kind of this way to Ireland, go through Ireland and come back in through, through Fishguard in the south. So that you get quite often a, a, an individual traveller will have a route across and a route across the bottom and you think, well, how did they get from one end to the other? It's because they went via Ireland and came back across. Um, but yeah, there's, there's sort of varied, varied methods, really. It really depends. So, some are literally just on their way to Ireland and they get stuck in Holyhead because it's bad weather uh, and, uh, you know, and get agitated about it. Uh, others will stay for, for, for quite a long time. And R Rodenberg was here for about three to four months, uh, during which time he learnt Welsh fluently, by the way. No yeah. <laughs> um, that's what, as I said, his account is a little bit worrying in places. Um, yeah, so you, <laughs> you've got different types. And we have also looked at people who've come... Uh, to Wales as exiles, for example, and ended up staying, particularly you know post post uh, 
Second World War, there's quite an influx of uh, artists and writers who, who, who actually come here and then end up staying. So it, it varies entirely, yeah. Uh, thank you. Is there any evidence that any of your German travellers have done some sort of homework by reading the German language works in there? I mean, I don't know if there are many, I mean, there's a German translation of William Bing's history by the 18th Well, I mean, I mean, quite a high proportion of the 19th century travels you would define as gentleman scholars anyway. So they were, they were part of that kind of um, environment, that kind of intellectual environment. So they would have done it, particularly in the latter part. There, there's a lot of them reading um, the various, you know, the works that start to emerge around Celtic philology particularly, uh, because they, beca they, you know, they noticeably become more erudite around the whole issue of the language at that point. Um, there is some German language fiction about Wales, not a lot, a couple. There's a, a, a short novella by Achim von Arnim called Owen Tidder, and then there's a really long, impenetrable novel written about three years later, um, by Willibald Alexis, which has to be the best name ever, uh, called Valadmor, which is set in Wales as well. Uh, but again, that's kind of picking up quite a lot on, on the Scottian myth that's, you know, around the betrothed, which was a, the, the Scot Welsh based novel. So, um, but some of them are, are very well informed. I mean, they, they, will, they will sort of narrate with, into their, um, their travelogue great tracts about, you know, Welsh history and uh, the culture and so forth, and they, they know they know about the Mabinogic, just they can't access it until guests' translation comes out, and then it becomes something that they can talk about. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. I hope I'm remembering this correctly, but I think it's Rosenberg who he was staying in San Barbecha. That's right. And did. any remarks on the cowbells on the hills behind? Yeah. And one wonders if he's actually rem reminiscing about his home country yeah. and not yeah. seeing what he's, yeah. what was there at all. Yeah. Yes, his, his narrative is, is, he was definitely here, but it's a very, very, very stylised travelogue. He stays with a family on a farm called Awern, I think it's called, in Aberquin Gregan. And he will give narratives of all these different people that he meets there. And, uh, that, you know, as I said, talking to them monolingually in Welsh after a fortnight. It's kind of like, really? <laughs> um, and he also comes back on his way, but two years later, he's on his way back to Ireland. I was away to Ireland rather, and he travels through North Wales again to, to revisit these people. And there's a whole big chapter of him kind of, uh, kind of sentimentally wandering around all the places he went to before. Um, so it's, it's quite, quite a, a, a strange it's text. More fiction than fact. It's it? difficult to pull apart, to be honest. Uh, and because it also contains um, it, you know, big chunks which are uh, fairy tales and a big chunks which are songs. It's got music appended at the back, a couple of, of, of um, notations as well. So it is a real hybrid text. But he was definitely here. It's just a bit poetic in his rendition. Yeah. yeah. Some more water. I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, to what extent um, do they engage in terms of did they from Germany? Did they engage with um, industrialists? The latter part of your question, not, not that we've come across. Um, because I mean, yeah. the travellers took to Snowdonia, who are most stayed with William um, and his um, family, to the extent that Barry William uh -huh. learned in German, yeah. and in South Wales, who yeah. the industrial area. Yeah. Yes, well, that's, I mean, that's where we get, we do, do get that link up. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but, I mean, they, you do get them referring that they've been invited round to see her, whoever, you know, that they've, that they've kind of... Were these industrialists yeah. inspired to come to Wales by these travel books, or was it the other way around, that the travellers were inspired to visit because of... 
Oh, de def definitely the latter. Definitely, they were they were coming to see the work that was going on because. Um, the whole area around Merthyr, for example, is just, uh, 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 they're amazed by it, the, the level of activity there and what it, you know, what, what it looks like, particularly in, in darkness. You, know, you get a lot of descriptions of this kind of hell-like scene that they've got before them. They also visit, I mean, in the north, the, the main attractions are um, Penning Quarry and Paris Mountain on that front. Again, they're, they're, they're very taken with that. And they're coming, they are coming literally to, to find out information to take back. It's very, it's very clear because it's you know, often with very detailed drawings as well in some of the books as, that are, are, are published. Wonderful titles. They've got titles that go on for pages. It's big long descriptions, you know, for what they've come to see. I know in America a lot of the bridge builders came here to see, like the Brooklyn Bridge yeah. was partly designed based on the Telfords. Yeah. 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 Oh, he's, he's God. He's, uh, yeah. Thomas Telford is God as far as the German, the, 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 the sort of mid-century travellers are concerned. They're just amazed by everything. That he's that he's he's created <laughs> by himself. Uh, yeah, yeah. Any more questions? One last Did one. Did any of the travellers concentrate on the mountains more than the industrial and the and the um, scenic views? Um. Yes. I mean, I think. In particular, of, of, of Snowden, what, yeah. We were the first ones to draw the attention of the Europeans to to Snowden. Well, they're kind of picking it up through, through the references in English Romanticism, but they're coming, uh, you know, they, they, they do in a way follow in the path of the so-called home tour tourists who've had already been coming to North Wales for a while, so they're kind of influenced by that. Uh, the work of, of Pennant and Hutton, for example, points them in certain directions, but yeah, going up Snowdon was one of the, it was very much a, a kind of bucket list approach in some cases and it was one of the things that a lot of them did and you get really wonderful descriptions of them you know crawling up this <laughs> in the mist and all the rest of it um or and then get to the hotel the sort of bothy at the top to get refreshments and then making their way back down again um and I, almost I mean, it's almost sort of, it's, it's almost it's exactly the comments you would get today you know i got all the way to the top and i couldn't see a the thing you know <laughs> It's, uh, you think, you know, yeah, you did that in hobnail boots, not great, you know, um, without your, your kind of uh, proper wet kit and all the rest of it. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the whole, the whole issue of the weather is, is, is also a big issue. I think I've, a few of you will have heard my quote from Mendelssohn, which is, uh, today's been a good day, I only got wet three times. <laughs> uh, kind of, he mentions that in one of his letters. Uh, not, not a happy bunny. Okay. <coughs> Around this time, do you have any women travellers doing this, or, or if so, do their accounts differ? There are f very, 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 very few German female travellers at this time. There's a few more French. Often they're in Wales because they have escaped France due to the revolution or revolutions. Uh, depending on which one you're, you're thinking of. Um, and they're quite often London-based well-to-do families who, who are coming over just because it's something to do for the weekend because they've got a bit fed up of London kind of thing. Um, you're not, you don't get the same, the same level. It's just not, it doesn't happen until the mid-20th the mid and then you see the, the, the genders kind of balance out a bit at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, although there are, there are one or two quite fit, famous. I mean, Madame de Jean Lee, for example, who who travelled around Wales uh, in the late 18th century. So there are some quite big names amongst the few women, but th there really are few. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you all.